Greetings and salutations, Digital World. Welcome back to another Spliced In Later. I hope you're doing well out there, and I hope you're ready for some more movie chit-chat and blah, 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 and everything else that goes along on this channel. Boy, oh boy, it's only been a week since I last spoke to you, but I feel like it's been a million years. I wasn't particularly well. Uh, it's a very unexpected illness that came my way to a point where it's only been a few days, but I could not for the life of me remember the last time I got on this microphone and when I spoke to you and what I actually spoke about. In fact, I was getting fully prepared to talk about the Silver Age of Disney before I remembered, wait, just a darn minute, I've already discussed that, and so I have. So we're going to try and keep this as a nice, simple episode so I don't get too confused or bamboozled with my own words like I normally do or with my head recovering from the cold that I went through. And I thought we would go back to the 100 movies bucket list that I talk about very often and pick a movie from there and discuss. And I wanted to pick something that isn't something that's come up on here much before, if ever. Something that is not mainstream, something that is not loved coherently by all walks of life around the world. The people who really appreciate this movie are proper film connoisseurs, film people who appreciate film as an art form rather than just a means of telling a story. And another reason why I've chosen this film is because I fell into that category that a few people I speak to now do fall into, which is that I was a bit overwhelmed by the prospect of watching this film when I first watched it due to everything I heard about it. I was worried that I would find it boring or that I wouldn't understand it or it would be a waste of time. But no, once I did see it, I absolutely appreciate it for what it is. However, when I try to recommend it to other people, I don't want to hide the fact that this movie is not for everybody. If you are somebody who loves a good beat em up sci-fi movie with spaceships that are shooting at each other, talking aliens, or if you like action-packed space movies in general that have nothing to do with aliens like Apollo 13 or Armageddon or something like that, this is a unique film in that it started. It starts the trend for what many movies have followed, but there's nothing quite like it. And many people that try to get into it, it's they get off to a rough start because a lot of them find it jammed down their throats at school. I know I was one of those people who was supposed to. I, I don't know why. I missed class that day when the movie was being shown. Was it by accident? Was it on purpose? I can't really remember. But people who I've spoken to who have seen the movie in school have always been completely bored by the first opening act or completely befuddled by what's going on or uh, not quite an understanding of the point or purpose of the film that it makes actually going back to it and trying to watch it particularly unappealing. Or maybe you've just watched The Simpsons, you've seen all the references to the movie, so you know what it is and you don't think you need to watch it. But enough dilly-dallying around the bush, what we are talking about is the movie 2001 a Space Odyssey, directed by Stanley Kubrick and what many consider as either one of the greatest movies of all time or certainly one of the greatest sci-fi films of all time. Now I know when we start talking about this movie there are people listening who probably never will watch it and that's totally fine, I understand that. I think I've narrowed down my common listeners to either the random person who's looking for a particular thing based on what I've spoken about that week who will click on and we'll probably click off after a few seconds, or maybe you'll stick around and listen to the whole thing because it's relevant to whatever current movie is coming out at that time. Specifically, my movie reviews always seem to get a lot of traffic because people are looking around everywhere for reviews about Godzilla vs. Kong. Whether they listen to my whole discussion about Godzilla vs. Kong is irrelevant, they still open it up because they're looking for that content. Or maybe you are a particular fan of something specifically, and when I do talk about it, that's when you come into the fold and you have a look at it whether it's Christopher Nolan movies, Quentin Tarantino movies, maybe you enjoy a good top 10, maybe you've been intrigued by the Disney stuff going in, whatever the case. And there are also one or two out of you out there who are basically just my friends who listen because they are supporting me, and I do appreciate that very much. I don't know if you guys are listening because you're genuinely interested in what I have to say, or if you're just there to support me. Either way, I don't care. I appreciate it regardless. But out of all those windows, all those people, I don't think a single one out there is going, I wish someone would talk about 2001 A Space Odyssey right now. Well, tough noogies, we're going to talk about it now. And if you are one of those people who clicked on this video or podcast app or whatever because you were anxiously looking for a discussion about 2001 A Space Odyssey, welcome. 2001 
maybe Ridley, not Ridley Scott, maybe Stanley Kubrick's best film. It's hard to say because Kubrick has done a wide variety of genres. This is definitely up there for sure, but it depends what you like about Kubrick and his, his the way he tells stories if you like this film the most. Or maybe you're a Shining Man or a Full Metal Jacket or a Clockwork Orange. Very different films for very different reasons. So it's hard to say that this is quintessential Stanley Kubrick. But there is a lot in it that really showcases his direction work, his camera work, his use of ambience and colors and long shots and creepiness, creepy characters. All of it is in here. So you can watch this movie and go, absolutely, this is a Stanley Kubrick. You can see elements of The Shining and A Clockwork Orange and everything else in this film. It is not really about anything, but it also is. But it's not definitively about anything. There is a very, 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 very unlinear plot that's sort of propelling the events of this film along, but this film can be broken up into four very distinct different acts, which reflect a different thing, a different purpose that I believe Kubrick was trying to portray in the movie. Linked all together, it isn't really a cohesive story. You do not go into this movie going, I know who the main characters are in the beginning, and by the end of the movie, it's like, I know what happened to my favorite characters. Did they achieve their goals? Were their arcs fully accomplished? Not really. 2001 is both a foray into the wonders of sci-fi and also, at the time, a optimistic look and approach at life outside space and also man's progression into space. Man or woman, the human race's progression into space. This movie gets lampooned a lot because it is called 2001 a space odyssey and the futuristic opponents of this film take place from 2001 onwards now obviously as we are now in 2021 it's a bit ludicrous i mean 2001 for us as a human race is remembered for a very different thing not the exploration of space however this movie was made in 1968 that was when the space race was huge the human race had not landed on the moon yet that was one year later but everybody was getting up there. The Americans, the Russians, they were firing all these rockets off into the sky, desperate to get up there to be the first to land on the moon, to conquer that strange, bizarre, empty void that was space. 2001 A Space Odyssey is an optimistic look by Kubrick, who may not even thought it was optimistic at the time. He might have thought this was perhaps a logical look at what the human race's progression once going into space would be. They were so desperate to get to the moon, to land on the moon. It's only natural to think, okay, in 40 to 50 years time, that'll be a common occurrence. We'll be going back and forth to the moon, no problem. It'll be commercialized. The real question will be how much further into space will we be? Will we be traveling to places like Mars? Will we get as far as Jupiter? Will the human race as a whole be going to places like Jupiter? Or will it be subjugated between countries as per normal? 2001 sort of implies that that barrier between countries is certainly there. We had the Cold War going on, all of that. I mean, the, the rivalry between America and Russia to actually go to the moon. If you're making a movie at that time, you're probably influenced to go, all right, that sort of unity may not be coming anytime soon. But then you also have something like Star Trek coming at the exact same time, which Gene Roddenberry's whole view of a united human race out in space, whatever. We, get, we can get lost in the semantics. I look back on 2001 and I have to say it's optimistic. And it's, it's a bit upsetting and sad because people like Stanley Kubrick and the human race in 1968 were probably looking at the stars going, absolutely, we're going to get up there. We're going to be going to the moon all the time. We're going to explore the stars. It's going to be great. Here we are in 2021. I don't think we've been back to the moon since the early 70s, I think. I got some of the information in Apollo 13, but to be fair, that's a rather Hollywood take on Apollo 13. But from what I could grasp from that movie, there had not been uh, many moon landings since the original moon landing. And at this point now, we're in 2021, what I believe is our approach to technology now, we're, all, we're definitely advancing in forms of technology and you know our smartphones and our, uh, the virtual reality and all that. But it's all very grounded in staying put on Earth. There's not a lot of advancing technology so we can go out into the stars and go to other planets. It's how can we improve our lives here on Earth, stay on Earth. Looking at that sort of approach to technology in our lives now, it's not hard to look at a movie like Interstellar, which shows that the human race going to space was less a 
a will to explore and more a necessity to survive because the earth had been drained of all its natural resources so the human race could not function on earth anymore looking at what we are here we are now in 2021 that's the future i can currently see for us which is very disappointing and saddening so it's nice to watch something like 2001 and go this is cool this is what people hoped this is what people dreamed of with their imaginations for the future their imaginations said technology can take us up whereas now technology can take us inward anyway getting a little too philosophical i'm not even talking about the movie let's talk about the movie for a bit i'll break it up into the four acts and i'll sort of say what each four act really sort of represents and what its purpose is and i will encourage anybody listening who has not seen 2001 whether it's because you're wary of it whether because you've tried it and you get a bit bored or it just does not interest you in the slightest it's worth looking into just if you're curious to see film as an art form don't pop it on if you're bored don't pop it on if you've got a spare afternoon and you, you you want something on in the background when you're doing some ironing or something it's not a very long movie it's only two hours and 10 20 minutes it might seem a little long compared to the, the 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 topics and stuff but we're in an age now where a wonder woman movie is nearly three hours long so not that long compared to where movies are currently going at this point and that's also including an intermission in the middle which you can absolutely forward through and that knocks off about 10 minutes the movie is also bookended at the start and finish with just a black screen and spacey music if you would like you can forward through that as well i like to sit in the dark with that on because it really gets you in the zone to watch this movie but if it's going to help you watch the movie feel free to skip those five minutes here or there either way now if you are desperate for a very very linear plot point if you want to know i need or if you desperate to say there needs to be a connecting point for me to watch this movie there needs to be some sort of story i can give you that there's a very basic sense of the story involving a mysterious monolith or monoliths that appear on earth and in space at various points in time and it's the mysterious of these monoliths and the way the human race or life on earth reacts to it in attempt to fear it to understand it to journey towards it whatever it is it's the mystery of these monoliths and why they have appeared and what is their purpose and all of that that the movie sort of shows us trying to learn there are no definitive answers in this movie you will not come out of this movie going i know exactly where the monoliths came from and i know what they are because i've watched it a couple times now and i have no absolutely no idea what the purpose is and what the point of it is but that's the very basic point that connects all the four acts together is mysterious monoliths and people reacting or trying to understand it our first act is called the dawn of man and this is where 2001 gets its its shade its its poo poos its its mockery which i can understand completely but keeping in mind this is a movie that was made in 1968 the dawn of man for 20 minutes just shows uh, some guys in monkey outfits jumping around shouting and screaming at each other now you can look at that and go okay that's silly i'm not going to watch that or you can watch about five minutes and go all right i'm bored i get it i understand it but this part of the movie only takes about 20 minutes so you can persevere you can get through it and if you look at the purpose of the actual story that it's telling and if you can look past the men in monkey suits it's a very interesting concept of the beginning of the human race and the human race's first instinctive actions basically the monkeys are bouncing around they are very docile creatures they literally sit on the dirt with all these animals walking around them they don't do much they just they just sort of exist cheetahs and lions come and pick them off one by one then one day a mysterious monolith appears and the monkeys are like well, that's very strange in their monkey way and a couple of them touch it and there's this ambient music playing which goes there's something spooky and odd about this particular monolith that they're touching once they do that the movie then shows them eventually start to start to walk a bit more on two feet they start to make more logical actions with their bodies that determine some sort of intelligent thinking and then they learn how to use weapons how to defend themselves the interesting part of this point is man's first instinct because straight away it's to incite violence monkeys get a hold of bones and they start 
learning to smash that's the that's the iconic bit with the the, the big dun, 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 dun. the monkeys are going ah they're smashing bones on the ground then you get some junk cuts though and animals are dying it's implying that the monkeys are now killing the animals that they were either afraid of or lived in harmony with in order to feast on and it's a very bloody concept even if it is men in monkey suits which comes to a head when the monkeys then start to use their newfound sense of self-worth and protection and violence to kill one another now looking at it as a basic point if you're not caring about this movie it's just men and monkeys jumping around doing some stuff and you can be like whatever but if you look truly into it it is a very interesting concept that when these monkeys turned into the human race essentially their very first instinct was to cause violence to cause war to defend look after numero uno to, to, to eat things that are weaker than them so that they can be strong to turn on each other to kill each other if they don't like each other now is that the human race as a whole is that its natural concept to evolving did the monolith that they touch influence them to be violence or did it just influence them to have intelligence and then once they have intelligence it's the human nature to be violent there's a lot of unanswered questions there which the movie doesn't really focus too much on it's just sort of it's a showcase it's an opening act if you can look past the silliness of it and if you can get to the 20 minute mark i think it's very interesting opening act to just basically what this is is a showcase of the human race and the wonders of where we came from and where we will end up but then after 20 minutes we get into our second act which is what i like to call basically just stanley kubrick going this is how i imagine the future will be the underlying concept of the second act again is that one of these monoliths has appeared on the moon but the human race now that has evolved where it's literally going back to the moon all the time notices that this thing's there so they go okay cool we gotta go check it out now it's very matter of fact it's very real life situation where if the human race discovered something strange happening our natural response wouldn't be to make a big hollywood propaganda thing out of it, it would be well we'd better we'd better gather some scientists and we better go have a look but we can't get there until thursday because i've got to go meet up with some other colleagues for some other business meetings uh we'll, we'll we'll get there when we can we'll take a couple of photos and we'll we'll have a look into it. we'll have a couple of discussions but overall we won't panic we won't freak out this is just part of our daily day life so a monolith has been discovered let's go have a look a lot of this act is again long slow shots which you need to allow yourself to appreciate to realize that you are being shown what this guy thought or imagined the human race would be doing at 2001 with common space travel again it's the 60s so compared to the uh, wonders and wonders of cgi that have been thrown at our eyes yeah it may not look particularly impressive but it's still interesting for sure you get to see a very commercialized world where going up to a space station and going to a moon is the same as catching a plane from australia to england you've got your flight attendants you've got your commercialized food you've got your, your your toilets and your seating positions very same as a plane everything's been adapted for zero gravity but otherwise everything remains the same when you get up to a spaceship it's full of full of duty free that you would see at the airport they've got their their hilton and their their alcoholic shops and restaurants and things the character that we follow uh, dr haywood floyd doesn't end up being the main character either he's just the character that is our focus of this point but he is the one going leading the expedition to discover what the monolith is but while he's doing that he's checking in on his daughter and he's he's meeting up with colleagues and he's he's discussing things that have happened it's very matter of fact stuff and also a great part of this act showcases what i believe has died a lot for movies which is the use of matte paintings if you don't know what matte paintings are matte paintings were what people did before cgi to establish background shots or larger than life shots or science pl fiction planets or spaceships basically little models and things and little artistic paintings all brought together for the use of differing angle camera shots to show things bigger or larger to essentially bring to life a spaceship traveling from earth to the moon or across the moon surface or a satellite with the backdrop of a moon behind it it was all painstakingly made from hand again you look at it now and if that was to come out in a movie that came out now you'd go oh it's completely fake completely unbelievable that looks like a model yes it does but 
it's the it's a credit to this type of movie in the 60s when people did this they painstakingly tried to make something look believable with the with the use of arts and crafts in their hands and it looks interesting enough to me i i appreciate that stuff the the detail to some of these spaceships because they got to go in for these close shots for these spaceships flying past the camera they look really detailed they look good to me and it's clever to take this little tiny model spaceship and put it onto the backdrop of a of a painted alien world or something and have it believably look like the spaceship is flying across that and then if the spaceship has to crash then they've got to put in all the all the animatronics to give it the sparks and the fires and the explosions it's very quaint and lovely and we don't get it anymore but it's appreciative to look back on something like that there are some uh, for uh, i think the only thing i can think of that comes to mind is the science fiction bbc sitcom red dwarf which has been around since the 80s which used map paintings to establish the ship red dwarf they also use a lot of cgi but where they can they love to take a paper mache of red dwarf and just smash it into a planet and blow it up and it's it's charming in a way moving past that into our third act which is the most exciting part of the movie i think where we have something called the jupiter mission which is going off to jupiter on board is dr david bowman and his friend dr frank Poole, together with their ship's computer how 9000 they're going off to jupiter no one no one on board knows why but we as an audience know they're probably going to investigate more monolith stuff this part of the movie really delves into a lot of kubrick's quintessential horror suspense now i've spoken to some people that have seen this part of the movie and they say well yeah but it's boring because nothing's happening well looking at the movie and rewatching it a couple times i can tell you everything's happening and the really powerful part of this movie is the use of eeriness and suspense and danger basically the part the third act of this part is that on their way to jupiter bowman and pool start to realize that their computer how 9000 something odd about him something is not quite right and as they discover that yeah their their lives may be in danger it becomes a race for survival as this as these guys have to stay alive on a ship that's completely run by what is considered to be a malfunctioning computer again the movie does not answer if how was ever actually malfunctioning or if he was following some other higher rule or if the humans were losing their minds it's hard to say but hal is a very iconic science fiction villain or science fiction horror trope you will have seen him in a lot of other stuff whether it's uh, evil computers rebelling against their pilots like the autopilot from wally -E, or even riffs like the simpsons halloween episode where they had the robot house with pierce brosnan as the computer who was essentially a how 9000 look but it was obviously pierce brosnan trying to kill everybody because he had the hots for march <laughs> When it comes to a point where Hal is actively fighting against the human, specifically Bowman, and he has to survive in space, has the iconic open the pod bay doors, Hal, sorry David, I can't do that. The eeriness horror is you've got Bowman in his shuttle and it's got all of Kubrick's quintessential lighting usage splayed out in his face with neon lights and red and blue things that sort of, it's, it's a showcase of insanity, of a fractured psyche. And then you've got Hal in a completely monotone voice just basically saying, sorry, Bowman, I, you have to die now. That's unfortunate. Goodbye. I've always enjoyed being your friend. See you later. And Bowman very calmly is like, no, I will not die. You will do as you're told. I Please let me in. No music is happening, and it's just this very eerie exchange between two two different types of creatures. One is a human who's trying to remain calm but you can tell inside he's panicking the f out because he's inches from death every second and then you've got this monotonous drawl from what could be considered a personalityless computerless drive who's seems content intent on murdering this poor human but the whole time he's polite about it he's kind his 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 quotes to him are pointed sinister yet apologetic it's unsettling and you look at it as, as I said, Kubrick was imagining what the future could be like. We could be going to a point where computers have that much control over our lives, where if they were able to turn on us, that's horrifying. Imagine what they could do when Hal 
starts to lose his bat side of the battle between him and him and the humans. There's also an essence of of philosophy of panic. Can computers feel fear? Do they understand their actions? What they've done? Can they feel remorse? There's a lot going on with that. But with the use of the matte paintings and the the eeriness of space, this is one of those completely accurate movies where once you're outside, there is no sound. So you can have an explosion at one point and then human bodies can fly out into space and it's just eerie nothing, which is creepy as hell. Truly interesting part of the movie. Doesn't take long to get to that point. And I think a really, that is the pinnacle point of 2001. It's the symbol of how that really showcases and hammers home how great a movie this is as a sci-fi tour de force, but also as a horror suspense thriller. There's a lot going on here that definitely needs to be experienced. Final act of this movie is batshit insane. I've rewatched it a few times. I don't know what the hell's going on. It seems to be just a an idea of what is beyond the infinite, of what happens when you go beyond the concept of two or three dimensions, the the powers that be above, the concept of time and space, linear from a perspective of start to finish or finish to start, what the the purpose of human life and how insignificant the life of a human being can be against the true against the true magnitude of space and the concept of life and death and time and space and all of that. There is no talking, there's not a single word uttered. You just watch this this particular character just going through the most trippy mind fuck I think that can ever be described. If you ever want to drop acid watching a movie, drop it watching the end of this because Jesus Christ. I do not know what happened, what the point was, what the purpose of the human going through all this was, what we are supposed to get from it, but it is a visual spectacle. 2001 A Space Odyssey can be described as a spectacle in sight and sound, and it comes to a head with this final act with the music going up, which is just this use of opera and cinematronic, if that's even a word, sort of quavering sounds to really make you feel overwhelmed by what you're seeing and then just throwing music and images and lights and sounds and all of that which just overloads the senses and then we get to a point where suddenly the idea of life itself is not as simple as we thought and then the movie's over just like that everybody this is one of those things we can discuss to the towers come home now, I believe there is a movie out there called 2010, The Year We Made Contact, which is essentially a sequel to this. It is a much more linear, straightforward story, which has a purpose and a point, which is that a lot of our characters head out to see what happened to the people at the end of this movie. And apparently, there are a lot of answers. There are answers to what the purpose of the monoliths are, what the purpose of the Jupiter mission was, what happened to our characters and Hal and everybody when they got there. Uh, what it means to the human race, what we should do moving forward, and it has positive reviews from what I looked into, so I hope one day I can watch it, but I don't think this movie leaves you with enough questions that you have to watch 2010. It's one of those things where you can have your own interpretations, you can decide whether what you saw had a purpose, had a meaning, or it was a complete waste of time. It's completely up to you, but having watched it a few times now, I still don't know what happens at the end there, and I still appreciate watching it. And my body has a different reaction to it every time I see it. The first time, I was confused. The most recent time, I knew when I was going into what I was going to see, so I allowed myself to try and catch everything going on. And even then, I, at the end, I thought my eyes were going to explode, and there's still stuff I don't think I caught. There's still a lot of symbolism in there that I'm sure has gone completely over my head. But it's an absolute baller of a time, especially if you're a film connoisseur, if you're not into just watching film for the sake of film, if you want particular streamlined stuff like comedy or drama, this may not be for you. But I'd encourage everybody, if you're looking for something new, if, you, if, you, if you're willing to try it, try it. It's, it's not for nothing one of the greatest films of all time. It's a tour de force, whatever that means. I googled it and I think it means it just excels in everything it's supposed to be achieving, which is absolutely true gonna stay up there i think 1968 sure it looks a little dated especially the men in monkeys suits but its purpose its questions its understanding its optimistic view of a future that has not been realized yet there's a lot in there that 
you have to unpack and decipher for yourself. And I think that I am richer for it for watching this movie, absolutely. And if you give it the time, maybe you will too. Or you'll absolutely hate it. That's completely understandable and expected for some people listening. And that's okay too. But if you want to give it a try, go for it. I've talked to you about something that's not Marvel. Speaking of which, next week we'll be talking about Marvel again. I will be giving you another look into the MCU and my continuing MCU series. Which when I say continuing series, all I've done is talk about Iron Man and then recently I talked about WandaVision. So we'll be continuing by talking about another movie from that wonderful franchise. So tune in next week for that. But otherwise, stay safe out there. I hope you've enjoyed my very long meandering about 2001. At the start of this, I said this was going to be a short episode. What do you know? But uh, until next week, stay safe, stay lovely, stay calm, stay calm, stay safe, stay nice to each other, all of that jam. I appreciate you as always. You've been spliced in later. Adios, muchachos. I'll catch you next time.